<laughs> Good morning. It's Silver Monday at Jay's Breakfast Club. Yeah. And guess who's here? Dr. Janet Seabrook. Oh, yeah. and, and what a time to have Doc in the house. Because Doc, I do know it's October. It is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Yes. We are all, let's make sure we are covered Mask with up. our masks. Mask up. And <laughs> I have some questions about that. Okay. Okay. And as uh, they say, wash your hands. So, Dr. Seabrook. Are you ready for I'm us? ready. Okay, let's so get the show on the road. As Kamala Harris says, Senator Harris says, I am so ready for this. And we are so ready to receive both you and Senator Harris. <laughs> so, um, so let's start off. Um, first of all, let me say thank you for that warm introduction. And I'm glad to be back um, at Jay's Breakfast Club for Silver Mondays. So let's talk about breast cancer because yes, this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, the entire month of October. I like to um, give reminders to um, women and men, because men get breast cancer as well, it's rare, but they still can get it, is that use things that will trigger your memory to get your mammogram screening. If it's your birthday, maybe it's your first child's birthday, when you first became a parent, or maybe it's Mother's Day around that holiday, or maybe it is sometime in October. But I always try to remind patients to have triggers that will remind them to get their annual screening. And so um, people also often ask me, when should they start to get mammograms? And it really depends on your family's history. If you have a family history where your mom, grandma, sisters, um, in that direct line, in that maternal line, or even on the paternal side, if your grandmother, aunts have had breast cancer, you might want to have that conversation with your physician to ask if there is a need for you to have earlier screenings. Typically what we find out is that if young, a young woman gets cancer, breast cancer, in her 30s or 40s, typically those cancers are more aggressive. And so I always encourage uh, people to talk to their families, get their family's medical history, and find out about their history of any type of cancer. Um, but right now we're talking about breast cancer. So that those annual screenings where you're getting them every year should start at 50. And you go until, typically you'll go until age 74. So from 50 to 74 you'll get those annual mammograms unless your doctor tells you you can skip a year. But typically those are annual. Before the age of 50, you, in your 40s, sometime in your 40s, you should have at least one mammogram. So in your 40s, we have an idea of what's going on with the contours of your breasts and anything that's going on in your breast. And if there's nothing found, then you can start at age 50 having one after that up until age 74. So after age 74? What happens? No more mammograms unless your doctor recommends it. Oh, wow. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Rosie, don't even tell me you're close to that. Right. Don't even go there. Sweetheart, I am 75 and proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. My mother would <laughs> never tell her age, and I always wondered why because when she left this earth, her hair was jet black. And no, she did not use Miss Clairol. Wow. <laughs> that so is wonderful. I'm, so have that conversation with your I, physician. I, I most certainly will because mm -hmm. I do an annual uh, mm -hmm. mammogram. Mm -hmm. And they always come back fine. Okay. Yeah. So he knowledge he, is powerful yes. people. Yeah, knowledge he or powerful. she may okay. recommend that you can go every other year or every okay. three years. So it will it depends. And a lot has to do with your family's medical history with breast cancer. Okay. And if those screens have been normal all of the years that you're having them, then it's less likely that you'll need to have more frequent they might even be willing to stretch it out a bit. Dr. Depending Seabrook, on your history, yes. What would you say to those who are fearful of getting the mammogram? Do you know how you have different tests and you just don't want to know and just say, I just 
just feel like it'll spread if I find out. I don't want to know. So here's what I would say to someone who is scared to have um, any type of cancer screening, but particularly a mammogram. As we just discussed, knowledge is power. Breast cancer, when it is discovered in its earlier stages, is you can actually cure it. You can have a lumpectomy to remove the lump, and typically there is no other treatment needed, no chemo, no radiation. The problem is, because of that fear, we will wait until it's obviously visible something wrong with the breast, and then the then it will advance. And those advanced cancers are much more difficult to treat. And typically those advanced cancers are when most African American women discover their cancer because they've been in denial for so long and they won't go to have those mammograms. So I encourage people by saying the earlier breast cancer is diagnosed and mammograms can detect uh, cancer almost like um, a grain of sand or a piece of rice. That's how good mammograms are right now. They can detect the cancer at that small. And when it's that small, you can just take out that piece along with some healthy tissue around it, and typically that takes care of it. If, when you let that go, that is the problem. And when you let it advance, that's an issue. Good morning, we'll be right here. One more question. I know that we assume that everybody knows, but could you just go over the signs, symptoms, and what we're looking for when it comes to breast cancer? And okay, so what you want to do is get to know the contours of your own breast tissue. So what does that mean? When, when I say that to you, what does that mean? It means that every month you should be at least once a month screening your own breast. Don't depend on your doctor doing your clinical breast exam in the office once a year. Now think about it, if I learn the contours of my breast, then when something abnormal happens, I can bring that to my physician's attention. So what do you want to look for? Any lumps that are different from what you have typically felt. Any lumps under your arms. Any lumps in the breast tissue itself any discharge from the nipples that is not milk. If you're not lactating, then you should not have a discharge from your breast, okay? Any type of dimpling, or it almost looks like cellulite or the peel of an orange, any type of change to the skin tissue of your breast is a sign that you need to go in and have that checked out. Any pain in your breast along with a lump, it needs to be checked out. So these are some of the signs and symptoms uh, of breast cancer. When does lactation typically stop for a woman? So typically you can, if, you, if, you're, if you've had children, um, you may get uh, some milky uh, discharge from your breast. If you are over the age of 40 or 50, you should not be seeing any milk coming from your breast. What we're, con what we're concerned about is a bloody discharge bloody discharge or a serous uh, almost like clear discharge with some blood blood tinged in it those are all signs and symptoms that people need to look out for yes ma'am dr seabrook black women typically have thick breasts and uh it's hard to tell whether you've got a bump or whether it's just that dense, I said they say dense breasts. What is, how do we deal with that? Okay, so that is an excellent question, and you, you use the correct terminology. Um, African American women typically do have denser breast tissue. Sometimes a uh, mammogram is not enough and your doctor or the radiologist may recommend that you also have an ultrasound to go along with that to make sure that those densities are just that and not abnormal breast tissue. It's just our makeup. It's just how we are. Um, as a part of our African American heritage, we have denser uh, breast tissue. I know I have uh, co-workers who to go because they, to get the test, because they have heard that you really can't get good treatment in Indiana, that you have to go to Chicago in order to get 
uh, treatment. So they're afraid because they don't have anyone to take them over to Chicago, you know, uh, that the survival rate is better for people who travel to Chicago. Is that true? Mm. So this is not something that I have heard. What I have found in my uh, practice, we try to remain for convenience sake with the best doctors possible in Northwest Indiana. Now there are advanced um, breast centers. Um, I know of one that is affiliated with the local hospital where all of the physicians and, and nurses that work there, that is their sole specialty is breast cancer. Um, so these advanced breast centers, that's their job. They do mammograms, they're able to diagnose very quickly and then get you into a skilled surgeon or to the uh, radiation oncologist or to the um, oncologist that will do the chemotherapy. So as far as I'm concerned for Northwest Indiana, we do have the resources. I think that people get the idea that you have to travel to Chicago or Indianapolis. And we do have the resources here. You just need to really probe and do your research on the available and advanced treatments that we do have in Northwest Indiana. And sometimes you may even find that those Illinois doctors or Indianapolis doctors have uh, offices here in Northwest Indiana where they're able to do those uh, treatments as well. So you have to do your research. Mm -hmm. As a follow-up, Doc, how can we expose our community to those? How can we put that knowledge out there? How can we educate our community so that we will know that we have uh, good facilities and capable facilities to treat any medical problem that we may have? What is our... What is, I guess I'm asking, what is our responsibility? How can we better do that? So one of the things that I like to direct people to is the American Cancer Society. We have a chapter here in Northwest Indiana, and they have a list of all of the um, imaging resources, the different hospitals that um, specialize in, in advanced uh, cancer treatments. We have some hospitals that are set up just like the hospitals in uh, Illinois but a lot of people aren't aware of it. So you can start with the American Cancer Society, the local chapter here, and they'll be able to give you a list of the resources that we have in Northwest Indiana. What services in that vein does Community Health Net offer your organization? So right now we, we have family medicine physicians, pediatricians, ob gyne doctors. We just hired a dentist. We have a whole dental team. We'll be going live in a couple of weeks and actually starting to see dental patients. We have optometry, um, vision care services. Um, so we have a wide range of services. So a man or a woman would be able to come in and see one of our family medicine physicians or nurse practitioners and get that uh, clinical breast exam, pap smear, pelvic exam, or prostate exam, and their PSA, whatever it is that they need it for their annual screening and then be given an order uh, to go and get a mammogram. You threw out a term, what's a PSA, doctor? <laughs> I know it as a public service announcement, what's a PSA? <laughs> PSA is prostatic specific antigen. Thank you. I'm sorry. And that is um, what we do. We give that test to men over the age of 50 to determine if they have um, elevated uh, prostate levels and if they're at risk for cancer. <laughs> So we, we, we talked about breast cancer. Is, it, is there another question? Not about breast cancer. Okay, because I, I was getting ready to move it on to something okay. else, so feel free. Okay, uh, a month or so ago, I read an article about a young lady who was starting something for special needs children in Gary because she was going to move to uh, Maryville or someplace where she thought she would get better services, but she started it, and I think I read that you were a supporter of it. Yes, I am. So her name is Tanisha, Janisha, Janisha, and her uh, program, We Are the Village, it started because she has a child that's on the spectrum of autism. And he, he did very well at Bethune, but Bethune only goes up to a certain age and grade limit. And then it was time for him to go to school. And she saw that his 
learning was going backwards because there weren't advanced programs within the Gary uh, district. So she found a program outside of Gary in Maryville that was able to bring him back to the point where he was at Bethune and help him advance further, where physicians had told her early on that he would not be able to speak and there were, he would have all kind of learning disabilities and um, miss all of his milestones. And with this intensive program, she was able to help him overcome all of that. So she's so dedicated and she saw what that one-on-one -on -one work did with her son she wants to start the same type of program in Gary so parents won't have to search all around <clears throat> excuse me, for resources like that uh, for their children. Something that goes beyond Bethune. Just to give you an update on Janisha, she is still fundraising for the location, but she's currently located inside of Gary Middle College, where she's able to, they've given her a space to do childcare and some of the early uh, developmental things with young people and so uh, if you follow her page we are the village you'll see where she just moved in there while she continues to search for a standalone and she's only 25 yes she's amazing. awesome she she's is awesome amazing. and so when we when we get um, young people like this who have so much drive and enthusiasm we want to encourage them and that is why I wanted to um, when Chelsea suggested her as a guest for my WLTH show, I was more than happy to have her on as my guest. And Natalie, she was so funny. She said, why am I even here? You guys are just carrying the show. <laughs> so it was a good, it was a good show. Um, I was able to um, um, find out a lot of things about her and her program and what she's looking to do. And it is essential because what we have found during this pandemic is that when, when schools closed, those children with learning disorders and disabilities, they really had some setbacks because virtual is not for everyone. You know, they need tactile, they need sensory, and they need one-on-one. -on -one. And a lot of times their parents didn't have the ability to do those things that they needed because there may have been other children in the home that were virtually learning as well. So um, what we have found, COVID has taught us a lot, but our children with special needs, they need that one-on-one. -on -one. They, they have to be inside the school building. They get used to a routine. And when that routine is broken, it at times causes them to have setbacks. So if that's one lesson learned, definitely is that our, our children need, especially our children with special needs, need to be in that physical space of the school building. Is that someone uh, you would like to invite to come with you? Or should we think about a separate space for her? We can because invite her. Because it seemed like it's really something that we need to tap into. So we'll we'll have a conversation. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, definitely. You will love her. You will love her. And the, the, you know, sometimes we don't really, and that's why I asked the question, how can we better communicate what's out there in our community? You know, and... You just made me tell my age. So there are many people in my age and our age group. Yes, please. We don't do Facebook. We don't do social media. So we've got to figure out a way to communicate to our community what's actually out there for us. Yes, and I, I definitely agree, and that's why I was so willing uh, to share my platform, um, the little bit that I have. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just teasing Chelsea. <laughs> Chelsea has me everywhere. <laughs> she has me everywhere, so I'm just messing with Chelsea. Um, but Chelsea um, has this amazing way of bringing um, her clients together and and finding where we fit and where we have um, ways to kind of lock onto each other's um, ideas. And that, that was just perfect because I, I did not know Janice, and I just met her that day that we um, went on WLTH a couple of, how long was it, last About month? month. Mm-hmm. And it's just clicked. It just clicked right, right off the bat as soon as we started talking. It was just a natural conversation. And the thing about Dr. Seabrook is she's a mentor. There's so many of us, me included, who look up to her. 
And so they reach out to her for the advice and just guidance on how not only to start the business, but just how to migrate yourself into the community to be a credible resource. She's credible. And so we look to say, how do we get credible? Uh, you have another example of another young lady who insisted that you mentor her. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she was so the, funny. Uh, I am one. Yes. Or I am them. I, I am them. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> she, she, she called. She emailed. She did everything <laughs> until she got into the office to see me. Aaliyah, she is, who talk about a dynamo. Um, tragedy happened twice in her life, broke both her brothers. She lost her older brother. Two, both older brothers, separate incidents of gun violence. Um, so she has started her program, I Am Them, um, and she wants to start a youth group mentoring young people, particularly our males, getting them off of the streets, um, talking to them, getting, you know, finding out what their interests are and trying to help guide and direct them into those interests that will help them make a living in the future. And she just insisted, and finally one day um, I said, okay, we can meet. And she came to the office, and she was just like a tornado. Not in a bad way, in a good way. And uh, we had a good conversation, and we actually had plans for her to uh, look at uh, pre-COVID, you know, ha having some space in our location until she was able to uh, find a building. Um, but then COVID happened, and we had to, you know, Look, look at that idea is that wasn't going to work, having children coming into the building and going back and forth with coronavirus running the way it was initially. Um, but That's a good segue, Don. It is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Round two of the, the, the heightened exposure. So th this is this is cold and flu season, right? Yes. So right. everybody, please get your flu vaccine. Get your flu shot. Okay. Come to Community Health Net, go to Walgreens, go, go wherever they're giving flu shots and get your flu shot. It's going to be very important because the symptoms are so similar. It is going to be very difficult for your health care providers to determine is this COVID or is this the flu. So when you get that flu vaccine, that helps us at least, you know, maybe put that this is the flu over to the side and focus more on some of the other things that it could be. Um, I don't know how bad this flu season is. I'm very hopeful that if we continue the social distancing, the hand washing, the using hand sanitizer, um, wearing our mask whenever we're out in public, I'm really hopeful that this flu season won't be as bad if we continue. Because typically when you think about the flu, we have these huge peaks during the holidays because people come home for Thanksgiving. We travel other places for Thanksgiving. People come to us for Christmas. New Year's Eve, we go out and about. I don't necessarily um, know that we should be doing those things this year. My family and I, we've already talked about it because I'm the Thanksgiving host and my mom is the Christmas host. We're not doing it. We're going to do virtual. <laughs> so everyone will be in their own dining room, and we can Zoom each other and show each other our turkey leg, turkey wing. <laughs> um, but we're, we're just not, we're keeping it limited, limited to each household. And then we're just going to Zoom probably at 4 or 5 o'clock in the evening and just talk about, you know, what we cooked and what football we're watching, if it's any football on TV. Um, but that's what we're going to do, at least my family. And I'm recommending, and I think Dr. Fauci also said, he told his adult children, don't come. <laughs> he said, don't come. As much as I would love to see you and my grandchildren, please don't come. Mm -hmm. The medical uh, person in Chicago, what's her name? Um, anyway, she, she was on TV as I was leaving home, and that was her recommendation also. Do your celebrations at home or, you know, with people that you that's in your bubble, so Right, to speak. right. Uh, back to the flu shot, Doc. Is there a difference in, and I don't really know how to ask the question, are all flu shots equal? Or is there a different one that should be given to different age levels? Okay, so answer to your question. The, 
the shot is the same. We, depending on your age, as far as if you're a child, you might get a smaller dose, okay? But it's the same medication. So flu vaccines are made from the strains of the flu from the year before. And so that's why it takes so long to get it. We put our pre-orders in in January so we can make sure we have the doses that we need um, by September. They usually get delivered to all the doctor's offices across the country by September if you have put in your order. If you wait too late and you wait until March or April to try and put your flu order in, sometimes you're, you're, you're just out of luck. So every January, my office staff, they go back and look and see how many we gave last year, and then they order that plus a little bit more. Um, and you have to, you have to get it in like that. But it's, it's the same, Miss, Miss Rosie, it's the same. However, an, an adult won't get the same doses as a child, but it's the same vaccine. Mm -hmm. That was a very good question. Mm -hmm. Well, before, you have another question? One more. Okay, go right ahead. Back to the youth. In our area, we have a lot of uh, young people who have who should have special needs services and behavioral problems. Is there anything out here in Northwest Indiana? Because one doctor told a parent, well, you need to move to Indianapolis so that your child can get service. And I just thought, that was a bit extreme. Right? Yeah, very, very. No, we have those resources here, um, Community Health Net has a clinical psychologist that does family therapy, also individual uh, child therapy. So there are resources in the community. Community Health Net, like I said, we have a, a behavioral health staff that um, is able to take care of not only the child, um, but the parent and also do family therapy. Then we have pediatricians that work in concert with our uh, clinical psychologist and his team to make sure that the medical needs are being met as well as the behavioral health needs. Uh -huh. So there are resources in the community, but like I said, you just have to be educated um, on what's, you know, I, we've, we've, over the years, we've um, gone over, you know, gone to places in Gary schools, talking to different uh, groups and things like that. And I'm always amazed that when people find out what's actually here in the city and they've been driving all, you know, all over Timbuktu <laughs> and they have it right here, they just don't realize it. Thank you. Yo, you're welcome. My question has to do with uh, this mask. And it's a conversation that continues to happen. Well, how should this mask be worn? The white side out? Or the blue side out? The well, white side in or the blue side in? I wear mine blue side out. Okay. I wear mine blue Does side out. Does it make a out. difference? Um, some people, I don't want to touch it because I, was, oh, I don't. It, it, cause, cause, it's a model. Okay. It's, it's a model. A, okay. Nobody's going to use it. Okay. <laughs> the most important thing is make sure that you have, because I've seen people wearing it upside down and it's not going to stay on your face because there's nothing here. Right. to hold. So this has to be you know, fold it to the shape of your nose. There's a little strip in here that's very malleable and it will fold to the shape of your nose. But you pull it out a little bit. So I wear I wear mine blue side out. Okay. Okay. And you talk about the importance of covering your nose. It's very it important. Doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> you're um, not, you're, impact anything if you're wearing a mask and you don't cover your nose. Right, because the droplets are coming out. And yeah. and if you if your nose is not covered then there's no purpose in wearing the mask. You're, you're not you're not getting the job done if you don't wear the mask over your nose. And, you know, you see people with it under their nose and their chin is covered. I'm like, your chin doesn't breathe. What are you doing? <laughs> My question is, you know, you have the vents that go down or up. Is there a certain way? Because some of them don't have that, the metal piece, but uh, I always look, felt that you should wear with the vent going down. What does it make a difference? What, for me, most of the masks will tell either like yours has writing on it, so you know which way to wear it, right? <laughs> but something like this, typically these masks will have this. If it's a surgical mask, you are going to have a piece in there. That's the right. That's the right side up. Okay. I don't know of any mask that doesn't have this. Those this, material ones you can buy from the store. That have a little vent on it. Yeah, they have, no, they have the, the lines like those, okay. and to always turn it to make sure the vents are going down. You know where. 
Yeah, like what's going down like that. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it should go that way. Yeah, it should. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful. Are there additional questions? Well, any mask is better than no mask. Okay. You know, you see people with their scarves up. I wouldn't recommend that because some of us might look like bandits. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if you have a mask, wear a mask. But if you don't, you know, a scarf or some type of covering over your uh, nose and mouth will suffice until you're able to get a mask. So are there additional questions? Comments? This is great. You're just quiet over there, and we're always happy to see you here on Mondays. Okay. All right. So we'll do our wrap-up. Have you done your – have you said all you need to say for today? If there aren't any additional <clears throat> questions, one thing, make sure you're um, getting your temperature checked. You know, if you're going into buildings, facilities, make sure you're wearing your mask. Use hand sanitizer. Keep extra mask in your car. Don't be like you, and in your purse or wallet or wherever. Don't be like me and walk out and say, "Shoot!" You got to turn around and go back and get your mask. <laughs> That's why you see so many people wearing just you know looping them around here, and then they can just pull them up when they get out of the out of their vehicle. But, I've learned to keep a supply of these in the car. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? Okay. I do, I do yes. Uh, my mom's 94 and we go visit her and see her. Is it anything that we should do in addition to the mask, the hand sanitizer, and the hand washing as we come into her home? So what I would suggest is um, take your shoes off. If you have any outer coverings on, like a jacket, take it off. You, you want to make sure that you're not bringing anything contaminated into the house. If you have a, a, a gown or a drape or an old house coat that you can leave over there that's clean and you can put that over yourself, over your street clothes, just, you know, to minimize the potential that you, someone could have coughed or sneezed on you, on your clothes. So just to minimize that. So keep something clean over there that you can put on to cover your clothing when you go over there. Take your shoes off. Wash your hands as soon as you get into the house and use hand sanitizer and make sure your mask is properly fitted around your face. 94, that's a blessing. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. And mm -hmm. we have to protect them. Okay. Check your temperature before you go in. You might want to think about checking your temperature before you leave your house. Because if you have an elevated temperature greater than 100.4, you should not see her. Okay. Or visit anyone if you have a temperature. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. And that brings me to something else. Uh, like I said, the pandemic has done a lot for us in a lot of different ways. At one time, I only attended my church on Sunday, but now I, I guess I attend about four or five different services. <laughs> and um, my home, right, my home church in, in uh, Alabama, I noticed last Sunday, Pastor Moore had a visiting minister. Before he introduced him, before he brought him to the uh, podium, he sprayed. Is that a habit that we really need to get into uh, in, uh, when we are either using the microphones in public places? Because I thought, wow, that was powerful. I just um, bought for all of our offices, and it was delivered um, over the weekend, those foggers, where you put the sanitizer in, and then you walk around, and now we'll be able to sanitize and fog all of our equipment, mm -hmm. the furniture, and the waiting rooms. And yes, I have been noticing more people as they're speaking into microphones. When the next person goes up, they will spray the microphone with disinfectant. Another helpful hint there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions? If not, Doc, we can't wait until next <laughs> month. What, we, what are we going to do next month? So I haven't decided yet. Oh, we'll, but that's we'll have wonderful. to see. Yeah, that's well, it's Maybe open. We'll invite Aaliyah and Janisha to join us for a round. Oh, wow. that would be great. What a wonderful I'll suggestion. Yeah, that would be great. And, okay. and then we'll be coming up on holiday time too, so exactly. we can reiterate, you know, our thoughts on not breaking bread at the same table. Right. We can break bread virtually right. this Thanksgiving, so we can also talk about that. For more information about Community Health Net, you can go to our website, chn-indiana.org, and our phone number is 219-880-1190, and that's chn-indiana, spelled all the way out, dot org. Are you on social media? 
everywhere, Chelsea, everywhere you have put me, everywhere you and James have put me, okay? Twitter, LinkedIn, all over Facebook. Thank you very much, both of you all. They had to drag me kicking and screaming, what was that, two years ago? Into, I had not, I did not have a Facebook presence at all, zero. Now, every time I open up the app, boom, there I am. <laughs> and that's wonderful, but we still have to remember those persons who are not uh, technology friendly. So we still have to get that word out to them the old fashioned way. And that still works, it still works. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next Monday, Silver Monday at Jay's, uh, we will have, we've invited several vendors to, if not bring their wares, at least come and talk to us about their wares. Because there's an important date coming up, and that date is November the what? Third. November the what? Third. Third. And we need to really let the community know that they need to vote. And I can't sit here and tell you who to vote for, but I can say we need to make sure. And because of, of uh, a certain candidate that's out there, uh, there's a group who's visibly uh, supporting, and they're the Divine Nine. So uh, next Monday, I have invited vendors to come and bring wear so that when we stroll to the poll, we can represent. And it, it doesn't have to be a Greek organization. We just need to, as a community, there are some important things right here in Gary, right here in Indiana, that we need to make sure that we are aware of and uh, get out to vote. Yes. And thanks again, Doc, for being here. And my wonderful, and I don't like using the word mine because I don't own you, <laughs> the wonderful people who show up here on Silver Monday, yay! Yes either here or online. Thank you.